we're going to be looking at the harmful attitudes. So what we have looked at so far is the helpful attitudes, like self-sacrifice, self-denial, self-discipline, reformation, and self-examination. Some of the things we're going to look at are really kind of the opposite of this, so we'll be covering them kind of what we already looked at in kind of an opposite viewpoint. And so these are the things that harm, harm us in developing self-control. So the four things we're going to talk about, two tonight and two next time, selfishness, arrogance, pride, and self-righteousness. Today we'll talk about selfishness, selfishness and arrogance. Now, with, um, with selfishness, it's kind of the opposite of self-sacrifice and self-denial, because you're kind of, instead of denying yourself, you're kind of promoting yourself, and instead of sacrificing, you're, you're kind of collecting everything to yourself. So selfishness is a, is a uh, kind of the opposite of those, so we'll look at that first. Um, why would selfishness be an impediment to self-control? It seems like, you know, that would be kind of the, the, the more natural path. If it's self if if I'm selfish, then it's all about me, uh -huh. and I don't have to control myself because what I want to do is okay. Yeah, so that just comes natural, doesn't yeah. it? Uh -huh. And we'll talk about that a little bit, but it, that all just comes very natural. So if if that's our motivation in life, that's actually pretty easy. We don't even need self control, do we? No. We just do what we want to do, and we don't have to mm -hmm. deny ourselves. We don't have to sacrifice. We don't have to to deprive ourselves. We just do what we want and get what we want. So we say, go it's simple. It feels good, do it. It's simple, yeah. So that may be one of the reasons why that kind of a lifestyle is so much uh, more desirable because it's just a lot less work, mm -hmm. a lot less things that we have to do. Now, if we're selfish, though, and we're trying to um, live a different type of life that requires us to have self-control, that means that we've got to that selfishness kind of puts an impediment or a blockage in the way, and we got to get around that, and that takes work, and that's that's where it tends to work against self-control. Is it it uh, makes us want to to have things that we want, and we have to put that behind, and so that takes control. I think selfishness maybe is just a little bit in all of us, so that we have to fight on different levels. Uh, but it just kind of seems to be an ingrained thing. It is. And I think um, Ken uh, Leach used to say that you come out, you're born, and you come out crying and demanding things. <laughs> well, right? it's true. <laughs> you're immediately, it's all about me at that point, isn't yeah. it? You don't care about the rest of the world. Uh -huh. It's just about me. Yeah. Feed me, clean me up, take care of me. I want, I want, I want. Uh -huh. Well, that's where we start. Uh -huh. And then we got to fix that later. So a lot of times when we're, that's why I think parenting and, and the way we raise children is so very important because we'll either teach them to be selfish or we'll teach them to be unselfish. And that sets a lot of things in place for where they're going to go. And if we don't do that well, they're going to have a lot of trouble with self-control because they will never have really exercised it. All right, so let's jump into uh, selfishness. And uh, let's look at some of the things that the Bible says about it. Um, so it's a, cons uh, it's a self-centered concern for yourself. It's without due regard to the needs of others. We don't really care what others need. We, we care about what we need. And so scripture treats selfishness as an aspect of sin. And uh, it urges believers to care for others instead of themselves. So the very nature of God's word teaches us exactly the opposite of what we naturally want to do. So, looking at 2 Corinthians 5, so we'll start right here, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, sin, uh, we see that uh, this is a, selfishness is a characteristic of a sinner. Thank you. Those? Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> and that's be, really because we're trying to keep the old self, and when we do that, we, we sin. Okay, so... In 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15, for the love of Christ controls us. Well, if selfishness is in us, then that's what controls us, not the love of Christ. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who might live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died. So, 
our calling as a Christian is to stop living for ourselves, quit being selfish, and live for Christ. So that's a completely different mindset. So in this scripture we see how that's to be done, but we also see that Christ set the ultimate example of not being selfish because he was willing to give himself up for us, which is complete, that, that's a very selfless act. So, um, we're to live for Christ now and not for ourselves. So, uh, Proverbs 18 and verse 1 says, He who separates himself seeks his own desire. So, seeking our own desire, that's selfishness. And he quarrels against sound wisdom. So, sound wisdom and selfishness are not compatible. Um, if we want to be self-seeking, uh, then we're fools. That's really what this is telling us. Okay, Romans 2. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing, storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath and, revela and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. So, what is selfish ambition is a little bit different um, because it's, it's kind of taking selfishness and coupling it with motivation or coupling it with a drive or a, um, an ability to make something happen. So if we're selfishly ambitious, and that means not only are we selfish, but we're pretty good at going and getting what we want for ourselves. We have an ambition for it, which is a bad combination. Um, it's good to be ambitious, but ambitious towards selflessness, not selfishness. Um, so if we're selfishly ambitious, we're not going to obey the truth, and then that causes us to seek after things that aren't good, keeps us from gaining Christ, and then because of that, we won't have the self-control that we need to overcome. So selfishness is a characteristic of a sinful society. So this is the way people are left to themselves. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 4. Realize this in the last days that difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. There's a theme that runs through almost every one of those things. And that has to do with love of something, right? And everything is about self. Love of self, love of money, that's for us, right? Love, boastful, that's about us. Arrogant, that's about us. Um, disobedient to parents, that's about us, our rights and our will. Ungrateful, it's about us. Unholy, it's about us. So everything is about us. We're conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And so really what we should love is that last thing, lovers of God. Everything else is stuff we shouldn't be doing. So left to our own, that's where we'll be. And so the things that we love are in contrast to the things that we ought to love, which is God. And so, you know, if we're lovers of God, it's so liberating. We don't have to worry about being all the rest of this. Yes. Because if we love God, we're, <coughs> it's, we're just not going to do that. <coughs> and these things are mind-numbing. They I mean, are. They, they just take so much work. And they're scary. And yeah. they're, they're just everything we don't want. <laughs> yeah. And really, when you think about the life, if you sat down and just wrote out the, the story of your life before you ever lived it, you wouldn't write this down. No. But, you but that's the way we to, live, left, left to our own. You, you just don't want people to think of you, and when, when they think of your name, you don't want to, so any of these things to no. come in, my, no. in their mind. Yeah, even if you are like that, you don't want people to, to know you're like that. Do you? you don't want them to think that. So we put it, we we add to all this stuff, putting on the face, right? So yeah. they can't see. Uh -huh. All right. So Judges twenty one twenty five and Judges seventeen six. This is in the days of the kings and the days of the judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's pretty easy, right? What do you want to do? Just do it. Whatever it is. 
<coughs> so that doesn't take any self-control. As we said earlier, that just comes naturally. When this is our focus, we throw self-control out the window because we don't really need it. Uh, we know that the, re the result of this behavior. So during the time of the judges, what was the cycle of apostasy, apostasy that kept going on? Yeah, they, they just kept going around and around. I think there were seven major cycles of apostasy where they, they would recognize they were in trouble. They would cry out to God. God would answer them and deliver them with a judge. They would repent. They'd live fine for a little while, and then they're back at it again. And that would be a, a mind-numbing lifestyle as well. So that's the kind of life that we'll have if we do things that just come naturally. When you think of a society that lives that way, what, what would you think would be going on in that society? Chaos. 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 Because there's no standard, there's no agreements, there's no uh, acceptable behavior. It's just whatever you want to do. And to some degree, we see that today. Yes. I, I don't want to be you know, a doomsdayer about it, but the more we don't respect authority and we don't have that level of who we look up to mm -hmm. as our guidepost or who we follow, then we will be doing our own thing. It, and it's almost strange that the more society tries to control things like what we say about others, the worse it gets. Yeah. Yeah. Because they want to control not how what we say good, but really allowing people to must play the worst society parts. Society to work for everybody yeah. regardless. Yeah. And it's not ever going to work. It's strange though because it's all about giving people their rights, but in order to do that you've got to you take, take away people's rights. You take right? away a lot of rights. You do. Mm -hmm. Especially religious. Yes, so if you're going to tell people you have to accept abortion as an example, then you're taking away the rights of the, of the pro-life people. Right. Well, they don't see it that way, but that's exactly what you're doing. You can't give everybody everything. It just won't work. And that's what we're trying to do in this society now. That reminds me of the first chapter of Romans. You know, they just get oh, yes. worse and worse. Yep. Because that, uh, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, and neither were they thankful. And, they really, and then it just keeps getting they, worse. They put themselves in God's yeah. position. Mm -hmm. So it's it's. All right. So if we look at selfishness, we can express that in a number of ways. One of the ways we can do that is greed. Um, greed is about wanting things for ourselves, right? So that's selfishness. Um, we want to acquire. We want things for ourselves. Uh, Matthew 23, 25 talks about um, the, the scribes and the Pharisees. They, they're clean on the outside. They put on a good face, but inside they're full of robbery and self-indulgence. It's kind of interesting. Those are the things he says about them. Self-indulgence is indulging yourself or selfishness. That's really just a different word for that. So if we throw off restraint and discipline and we yield to the desire to gratify our selfish appetites and our cravings, that's what greed is. Well, self-indulgence that is not consistent with being clear and clean and pure, it's actually the opposite of self-control. <clears throat> we know that the rich man uh, was self-indulgent because he just didn't he didn't deny himself anything, and it landed him in Hades. So, some examples of greed. Uh, when we look at Mark chapter 12, let's see, am I caught up with myself? Yeah, Mark chapter 12. Yeah. So here on this one, Mark 12, um, the vine growers, uh, there was, there's a whole story about the vine growers, but when the heir comes, they, were, uh, they decided let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. They were just greedy. They, they were okay with killing somebody to get what was his and not theirs. And that's what greed will do for us. In Luke 12, 31, uh, 13 through 21, this is the whole story about the man who, um, who asked Jesus to tell, the, tell his brother to divide the family inheritance with him. He was more concerned about what was, what was owed to him and what was supposed to be his, and uh, he wanted all of that. And so there was a parable told to him about the rich man who uh, had so much uh, coming in that he had no place to store all his crops. What was the outcome of his 
lifestyle of eat, drink, and be merry. This night. Your this soul night, your soul will be required. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're not rich towards God, then you're of no value to God, and therefore your life has no meaning. Uh, in Acts chapter 5 and verse 3, Ananias, um, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land when he said he'd given it all and he didn't? Um, in each of these cases, greed caused them to uh, do something that um, where they wanted something for themselves, and somebody in each story died as a result. Uh, that's not always the case. Physical death isn't always the outcome of greed, but spiritual death is. They want something so badly they were willing to sacrifice even life for it. So that kind of temptation makes it difficult for us to control our attitude. So even if we don't want someone something bad enough that we're willing to kill, generally when we want something bad enough, it's hard for us to control that. So keeping that, that desire to have in check is really important. What do we call it when we have taken those, those desires like that and, and we've kind of normalized them and we're happy with where we're at? Rationalization. That's rational, but it's also contentment, right? Yeah. Instead oh, of wanting okay. well, all the time, we're just yeah. content with what we have. Um, and that affects our conscious too. It does. Mm -hmm. Because it'll skew our conscious one way that it shouldn't be. It's a way away from God. Mm -hmm. And it, so the standard begins to change, and what we what we're willing to accept gets further and further away from what we're supposed to accept. So another way that we can express, uh, express selfishness is through selfish ambition. We saw that a little bit in one of the scriptures that we read already. But in Philippians 1, verse 15, right there, it says, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but also some from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. So what was their motivation for preaching? Get somebody else in trouble. Yeah, Paul. Thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were just trying to cause trouble for Paul. And that's not a good reason to preach, but that was their ambition, and that was not an ambition uh, directed at improving God and His Word and His, his kingdom. It was about improving Himself. Um, so if we have a personal drive to accomplish something for ourselves instead of others, that creates a temptation for us, and it makes it difficult sometimes for us to do the right thing. James 3, verses 14 through 16, If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. There's all the things we're looking at tonight. The wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but it's earthly, natural, demonic, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. We just said that, right? What is the outcome of everybody doing their own thing? Chaos. Well, that's just another word for disorder in every evil thing. And so, bitter, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition will cause us to think we're doing well. when We're actually not doing well. And that's where that standard gets shifted. We, we begin to shift the standard to be more what we want rather than what we know is true. And then when we do that, we're lying against the truth because the truth is not where we're basing all of our decisions on. And the end result is disorder and every evil thing. <clears throat> so when our goal is to promote ourselves, we're going to fall into every form of evil. When we want to pr promote uh, others over ourselves over others, we'll find it difficult again to exercise self-control. And that's, as we already said, that's where our society is getting in trouble nowadays. Another way we express selfishness is boastfulness. Okay, with boastfulness, here we are uh, speaking of abilities or characteristics showing a pride or a self-satisfaction. We're satisfied with ourselves. We boast about it. An example of that is Herod when he didn't actually say the words, um, the voice of God and not a man, but he certainly sat there and accepted them. <laughs> and so he was so proud of someone saying that about him that God killed him. Um, because he didn't give God the glory. So it, boastfulness is just another way of showing selfishness. And uh, Herod did that, and God made him pay. Not just pay, but he paid painfully. It's a painful way to die. So uh, an example of selfishness, a couple of them. 
uh, Lot. Did Lot get himself in trouble when he picked the fertile land instead of the desert land? Sure. Oh, he created himself all sorts of trouble. If he had said, Abraham, I defer to your judgment, would things have been better? Yeah. It would have been, because Abraham was looking out for Lot, mm -hmm. and Abraham looked out for himself, and Abraham was more capable of handling whatever situation where Lot was not. Probably Abraham would have said, okay, you go down here and take the best part. Because Abraham was unselfish. He yes. was looking out for Lot, as you said. But and Lot, Lot would have went in there with a different attitude. Yeah. And he would have had a different way of viewing that. And so uh, if he had deferred, he would have been in a better, a better situation. Uh, James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder. <clears throat> Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. Is that what's good for us? <laughs> God, please do whatever we ask from you. <laughs> no. no. And so they wanted places of uh, prominent places in the kingdom. That was just pure selfishness on their part. Uh, okay, some antidotes to selfishness. What's an antidote? Well, if you take poison and you get the antidote, it cures your poison, right? It keeps you from dying. So here's some cures for selfishness. The first one is God's Word. Um, and clearly God's Word teaches us a lot about avoiding selfishness. And so that's the first step. The second one is looking at Christ. He, he provided us the, exact, uh, the perfect example. So in Philippians 2, verses 4 through 8, um, we're not supposed to look out for our, only for our own interests, but also for the interests of, of others. Have this And the way we do that is to be like Christ. Have the, this attitude in you, like Christ Jesus did. And how did he do, demonstrate that? Well, he emptied himself. He was God, emptied himself down to being lower than a man and took, took the form of a bondservant and uh, humbled himself even to the point of death. Not just any old death, though, a debilitating and demoralizing death on the cross. He was willing to uh, humble himself, and so that's a way that we can defeat selfishness. Another one is to die to the old nature. Um, what is our old nature? Selfishness. Yeah. Just, we're born with that, right? That's what comes naturally to us. And so we've got to put that off. So dying to the old nature. Um, <clears throat> in Romans 6.6 6, it says that we, that we uh, crucify our old self with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Ephesians 4.22, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. So your old self may have been selfish, since that's what the world wants us to be like. But we've got to put that away so it can be clean and pure and uh, fill that with purity in the right way. Another way is to serve others. Sometimes rather than thinking about the theories of all this and, and kind of plotting our way through it, sometimes you just got to go do. Just go do something. Serve one another. And that's what 1 Peter 4.10 says, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards. That takes the focus off of us and puts it on others. And do we get lost in that? Yeah. When you're helping someone else, do you get lost in that? Okay. Yeah, you forget about yourself, don't you? Is that good? It's usually very good. Yeah. That's a very you good know, exercise. I'm having such a hard time with that because... The, the gift that God gave me was serving, and I loved it. And I did that all of my life till I got too old mm -hmm. to do much more. And that hurts me more than anything. I mean, I understand, but it, it still hurts sure. because I can't do it anymore. Sure. And it, it was such a joy. But you, but you know, have a different crowd now that you can influence, right? And yeah. You, and, and you know, if you, uh, I would bet if you went to Kibble, we'd find you everywhere, <laughs> wouldn't we? We probably and would. And you're influencing <laughs> everyone, aren't you? Uh, so don't don't diminish your influence and in your the way you go about doing things. You just do it in a different way. But it crowd. just seems so little. Yeah. That but, I, but you know, just I know the Lord water, knows, right? just and He knows how old I am, and and getting infirm and. But there, and I've got to fight against that yeah. because I've I've got to defer to 
where I am yeah, now. And it's not really the amount, right? It's the attitude. It's I hope what's so. Behind it. <laughs> I and really hope so. Getting out there and doing it. <laughs> and so you now know. we need to realize this special gift. This special gift is different for everybody. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we defeat ourselves because we compare our gift with somebody else. It's true. Or we might look at somebody else and think that they don't have the same gifts as us, so they don't measure up. We need to be really careful with that because we all have our own special thing that we mm -hmm. that we're good at that we mm -hmm. do. Yeah. And you know, as a church, all those things combined mm -hmm. strengthens us. Yes. Yeah. If we were all the same, we wouldn't get much done. Exactly. He puts in the body the pieces, the parts exactly like he wanted. That's what makes a good marriage, yeah. I think, is when both people have different skills mm -hmm. and every, with with the combination of all the skills it's a full unit mm -hmm. in and of each of other we're flawed we're just not capable of doing everything mm -hmm. but together we're full we're complete mm -hmm. and that's the way the church is mm -hmm. um, it does the same thing all right so um not only do we serve one another but um another good uh, way to do this is to love one another so in Romans 13, verses 8 through 10, it says, Owe oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. That's what we owe each other. He who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in the saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he's saying, you can find any, any law you can think of, you can sum it up as love your neighbor as yourself. Other than one other law, which is, love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, and your mind, those two cover everything. There's nothing you can find that won't be covered by those two. And so he says, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're going to cover a whole lot this of things. This is the whole law of God. Yeah. So love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So selfishness doesn't accomplish God's work, but if we love one another and to a higher degree, then we'll be in agreement with God's law, and then this attitude will save us from a whole lot of sins that we could be committing. So loving our neighbor is very important, very critical to being a Christian. All right, so we went through that fairly quickly. We threw a lot of stuff, I threw a lot of information out because we're just hitting the tops here. There's just so much information here. Arrogance. What is arrogance? I, I sat and thought about this for a while. What's the difference between arrogance and pride? When I first thought about it, I said they're the same thing, but they're actually not. Arrogance is not listening to reason or anyone else. Arrogance builds pride so high in, in yourself that um, you have all the answers. And arrogance comes out, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Arrogance isn't kept within. Pride can be kept within. Pride can be, you know, I'm just, I'm so proud of myself and confident in myself and the things that I do that, that I'm, I'm good. And that doesn't necessarily always have to come out, but with arrogance it always comes out. Now, pride can be looked at as positive or negative. I can be proud of being a servant of God, or I can be proud of myself. Arrogance, always bad. There's really no way to be arrogant and be good. So, arrogance is usually unpleasant behavior towards other people. Um, so this is an attitude of our heart um, you believe you're superior to someone else in what you're capable of or you're more important than someone else and so with that um, it characterizes a wicked person um, Psalm 73 uh, some of the words in here I was envious of the arrogant I saw the prosperity of the wicked there are no pains in their death and their body is fat they are not troubled as other men nor are they plagued like mankind, for pride is their necklace, their garment of violence covers them. Their eyes, eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens. Their tongue parades through the earth. Therefore, this people return to this place, and waters of abundance are drunk by them. They say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with, with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease, always increased in wealth. For some, that's the perfect description of life, isn't it? Yeah. That's where I want to be. I want to be on top. Yeah. I want to be the one making all the rules. I want to be the one taking in all the fatness and goodness. Well, they seem to be doing really well. And 
Here he says, I was envious of the arrogant. And we can get that way. We can think that's a good thing. And that causes us a self-control problem, even being uh, envious of them. But being one of them, uh, that's a, an even bigger problem because now we have attitudes that we've got to control that keep us uh, busy with our self-control. Psalms 94 says, How long shall the wicked, O Lord, how long shall the wicked exult? They pour forth words, they speak arrogantly. All who do wickedness vaunt themselves. They crush your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They slay the win widow and the stranger and murder and the orphans. And they have said, The Lord does not see, nor does God, the God of Jacob, pay heed. They think they're in control. They think they've got it all covered. But um, what are they doing to God's people? They're crushing them. Yeah. And so, is, do you think this is an acceptable way? No, this is, this is very, very bad. Uh, it per permeates every part of our life, if we're like this, uh, all the way to our bones. So, sometimes uh, arrogance arises from just being overly confident. And this is where raising kids gets to be a challenge. Do you want your kids to be uh, confident? Absolutely. Can they be too confident? Yeah, they can. So that's a tough battle sometimes. So uh, 2 Kings 4, 10, 4, 14 10, you have indeed defeated Edom. Your heart has become proud. Enjoy your glory and stay at home. For why should you provoke trouble so that you, even you, would fall and punish Judah with you? So this was Amaziah, the king of Judah. And he was, um, he was, had done really well fighting. And he was a good fighter and he had won a lot of battles and he decided to go against his brothers. And he was getting so confident in himself that he was going to go fight them. And they said, Israel said to Judah, don't do it. Which usually it's the opposite. When Israel is telling Judah not to do something, you know you're in bad shape. And so um, they said, don't do it. And he did it anyway, and the temple was routed. All of God's implements in the temple got taken away. So um, that was a very bad situation, and it was just because he was overly confident in himself. And then in Ezekiel, behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food and careless ease, and did not help the poor and the needy. So this keeps us from doing God's work when we're so comf when we're so arrogant in ourselves that we just we want to have abundant food, careless ease. We won't help the poor. We won't help those who are in need. It's just counter completely counterproductive. Um, and keeps us from doing what God wants us to. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 10. talks about the people who didn't tremble when they reviled angelic majesties. If you were rebuking an angel, would you be a little afraid? You should be. Don't, uh, and he says, angels are not so arrogant that they would go accuse you before God. What makes you so arrogant that you'd go accuse uh, them before God? And uh, they're just like unreasoning, unreasoning animals. So they think they're of a heightened awareness, but they're unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge. God will destroy those kind of people. They're self-willed, they're overly confident, and uh, they'll, they despise authority. <clears throat> they like to issue lots of words. The arrogant do utterly deride me, yet I do not turn aside from your law. So that's what... When the arrogant come against us, we need to not get caught off guard and, and lose our focus. In 1 Samuel 2, verses 3, it says, Boast no more, so very proudly do not let arrogance come out of your mouth. The Lord is a God of knowledge, and with Him actions are weighed. I think that says God knows you when you're arrogant. He's going to judge you for that. He's going to take action. He's a God of knowledge, and He's a God of judgment and action. <coughs> so... Arrogance is essentially rebellion against God. Why? Because we're putting ourselves on the throne. Right? We think we're better than everybody, including God. He and gave so, us a perfect example of humility and expected us to follow. Yes, and so what we're doing with that is we're putting ourselves on the throne. Yeah. Well, that's, that's completely against what God wants. So in Nehemiah 9, it says, But they, our fathers, acted arrogantly. They became stubborn and would not listen to your commandments. So arrogance causes us to be stubborn. Stubbornness causes us to not obey. You think that's a problem for self-control? Huge problem for self-control. And so uh, they became stubborn and appointed the leader to return them 
to slavery in Egypt. That's how far they were willing to go. Go completely against what everything God had done for them and go backwards. Uh, Nehemiah 9.29 <clears throat> this is during the time of the judges. It says there that they acted ar arrogantly and they did not listen to your commandments. And so they wouldn't listen. They, they rebelled. And that's again the cycle of the judges. So the troubling thing is arrogance may even be found in the church. Why is that? Hey, people. We're people, right? Mm -hmm. We're not above this. So um, in 2 Corinthians, Paul says that... Um, He's afraid that when he comes to see them and find them, he's going to find all sorts of people there, like those with strife and jealousy and angers and tempers, and one of the things is arrogance. Um, in 4, 1 Corinthians 4.18, it says, Some have become arrogant as though I were not coming to you. And they were thinking so highly of themselves that they, they felt like they could say anything about Paul and anything about God's Word because Paul wasn't going to come and correct them. And, uh, and Paul had another thing a message for them that he was coming, and uh, but they were so arrogant they would just speak against him. In uh, 1 Timothy 6, 17, those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. So one of them is fixing your hope on yourself, the other is fixing your hope on riches, but instead fix your hope on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. And then finally, there's two more sections here that godly should reject in our arrogance. And uh, that's because God hates arrogance. And in, in all the verses here, Proverbs, Jeremiah, 1 Corinthians 4 and 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about how God hates uh, arrogance. And then in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 7, he says, What makes you think you're better than everyone else? Everything you have, I gave you. God gave us everything. Why would we boast like we did something special? And then in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, we find out that, that uh, if we have love for one another, we won't be arrogant because we're boasting up for others. And then finally, the last point is that God will punish the arrogant. And I'll let you look at the scriptures around that. But they, basically, he says, I will destroy you. I'll take you out. I will make you invisible. You'll die. And so that's the fate of the arrogant. And all of that is just a huge impediment to us when it comes to our self-control. So we'll, next time we'll look at the at pride, which was actually when we did the survey, that was the third major topic that you all thought were, was important was pride. So we'll talk about pride and a little bit on self-righteousness. And then after that, we'll go into habits. Amen.